I'll talk about the first thing here. All right, so digital forensics is gathering evidence on a machine, um, any machine that can store digital data. Like I mentioned, cell phones, cameras, GPSs, all these things. And this is now a science and it's now accepted in court. Uh, it is, in fact, forensics is a whole lot less reliable than you would like. For example, they recently declared that fiber matching, like from cloth, is no longer accepted as forensic evidence. And polygraphs never have been. And a lot of people go to prison for a technique that they later decide was unreliable. And there's a lot of crooked forensic examiners that lie about the results. So it's a problem. But computer forensics have a pretty good reputation. You can really clearly prove what's going on on a computer, although you have to know what you're doing and you have to be careful. And there are a lot of incompetent computer forensic examiners. One of my teachers was uh, Steve Haley, who is the official forensic examiner for the um, high school teachers union in Washington State. And he told me every time he goes to court, the other forensic examiner has made a terrible mistake and he's able to wipe them out. And this turns, I didn't know this, maybe you people did, there are actually a lot of teachers that are pedophiles. I, and so that we, it's often accusation that teachers are watching porn on campus, sending inappropriate messages to students and things like that. And of course the parents get very, very angry. And so his job is investigating those cases, finding out what really happened. And he's had cases where um, Incompetent examiners have accused the wrong person because the perp changed the date and time on the machine to make it point to somebody else and they weren't smart enough to check for that. And that's the thing, you have to be careful with what you're doing. And one important thing that I learned when I started doing this stuff, you cannot trust any of the tools too much. You already know that everything has bugs. Your iPhone has bugs, your PC has bugs, and all your forensic software has bugs. Anything important, you have to verify it with a second tool. Um, you, you cannot trust anything it says very too far, certainly not far enough to throw somebody in court, throw somebody in prison for it. So be aware of that. Just like everything else, the software has updates and flaws and bugs, and sometimes it's wrong, but most of the time it's right. So um, here's some common myths. It's not the same as computer security at all. Computer security is just creating a secure environment to do computing on. It's defensive primarily. Computer forensics is investigative, like detective work. Um, all right, and so, uh, all right. Uh, and you can be investigating computer crime, although as I say, there are a lot of other uses for computer forensics now um, related to that, like investigating attacks, incident response. All right, and resurrecting deleted files is one of the main things you do with computer forensic tools. They can find data that has been erased because very many, many people are aware that they should at least take the bad stuff and drag it in the trash can. And then they imagine they've hidden the evidence, but they haven't. With a forensic tool, you can recover it. And therefore, recovering things that are lost by accident, you can also do with these tools. All right, now let's see other things. Um, we'll talk about uh, search password crafting and decryption to some extent. All right. So email is big. And by the way, um, the law is a big issue for computer forensics and the law is pretty much a mess because the computer technology evolves way too fast. So a lot of laws uh, are not really appropriate. And here's one of them. Uh, the law about email was written, I think, in the 80s or maybe the 70s. And at that time, everybody had something on their machine like Outlook Express and the email would stay on it would not stay on a server because the server drives were not big enough you would download it to your personal machine and delete it from the server and so they wrote a law that said anything that is left on the server for some period of time i think it's 120 days is now considered abandoned and you can examine it without a search warrant nowadays this is complete nonsense because most people use services like gmail where the email is on the server and you never take it off the server you read it locally but it's, the law is still there so email is a lot less private than you think it is and this is true of a lot of things. Anyway, an email is also very valuable because it's very easy to understand. Um, a lot of computer forensic examiners are college teachers. It's pretty much the same thing. You have to take something complicated and you have to explain it in simple terms so a non-technical person can understand it. You can prove something, but to get a conviction, you have to convince the judge and the jury that you've proven something. You can't be using a lot of technical terms and charts. You have to give something they can understand, and most people can easily understand emails and pictures. You don't have to like d discuss binary or registries or operating systems or anything for that. They can see, here's the picture of this person doing the bad thing. There, there's your evidence. So um, hashing is very important. Hashing is a way to put a fingerprint on a file. You, count, you combine all the bits in the file to get a fingerprint, and that if you make a copy of the file, you can verify it and know that the file has not been altered. And this is important in forensics because the first thing you do in a lawsuit, for example, which is what most of it is, also in, uh, in criminal trials, you 
have like a computer which has evidence. So the first thing you do is make an image of the computer, then you lock up the original computer in a safe and you never touch it, and you work from a copy, and you make two copies, one for the prosecution and one for the defense, and they verify the hash value to both have a complete copy. Now you analyze the copy. You don't touch the original evidence because that's best evidence. When you go to court, you have to have the thing. This is the computer that was used for this. This is the gun. These are the gloves. You know, the real object that was really used in the crime is a special value in court. And you don't need it after you make a good copy. You work entirely from copies. All right, um, if you tamper with evidence, that's a serious crime. And as I mentioned before, if you're a company and you erase evidence or don't produce it in the discovery, you typically lose the lawsuit right there. Um, that's not exactly, evidence tampering is even worse where you would actually modify it and submit false evidence, that's a crime. Um, all right, and like I say, email is admissible in court, printouts are okay, and like I mentioned, there it is, 180 days. If anything sits on the server for 180 days, it's abandoned email and it now can be examined without a search warrant. So that's a little disturbing. Images are big evidence, of course. Uh, not only because they're very easy for the jury to understand, but also because they often have extra data that people don't expect. Uh, this is how John McAfee was caught. John McAfee was, after he wrote the antivirus, he became a wild man and went to Costa Rica and other countries and killed, apparently shot his neighbor and went on the lam. And he was on the run. And then he had an interview with Vice magazine. And they took a picture of him and put it in the magazine. And they didn't clean the picture first. So the picture had his GPS longitude and latitude in there. And so they caught him and locked him up where he apparently committed suicide in prison. But anyway, that's the issue. So uh, there are bitmap, JPEG, TIFF, and PNG are common formats for images. There are others. And a lot of them do store information like latitude, longitude, name of the registered owner of the software, name of the camera, date and time, all sorts of useful information. And many people use cameras like their cell phone without realizing that is happening. So there, and there, there are people online that will stalk celebrities and find their secret hideout from the pictures they put on file sharing websites and so on this way. And video, of course. Now everybody's got video all over the place. Surveillance video is everywhere. It must be 10 years ago I read that the average Britain gets photographed 180 times a day as they wander around in London, and Americans, it's like 140 times. It's probably a lot more now. In America, there are special legal protections for audio recordings. So we don't have microphones everywhere the way we have cameras everywhere just because of that law. In Britain, they do not have that law, and there are microphones out in the street, out pubs and everything, recording what people say in addition to what they do. But it doesn't happen that way here. All right, and so you got ATM machines have videos, and these ring doorbells have videos, and there's typically tons of video recording what everybody does, and we all know you see this stuff pop up on social media. Whenever a bad thing happens, there are amateur videos. Um, all right, so closed circuit TV is the old fashioned technique where you have the video going just to one person, typically analog. Uh, most people have digital things now, but they're out there. So, all right, video evidence, of course, can be the most compelling because it's very easy for people to understand, very easy to see you did something, and then when you try to say, I didn't, they say, well, I see you doing the bad thing right there. All right, so um, web requests, searches and websites gone to are also very important. I see a endless, endless news stories about somebody that like commits a murder of, say, their husband, and then they have their internet searches the last week, or how do you poison my husband? How do you hide the traces? This is very common. Uh, the searches are recorded on your computer, a forensic examiner can find a list of the websites you've gone to and the searches you've done, so they're often quite damning. This uses HTTP. Your client computer is here. It can be a cell phone or any other computer, internet connected device. You send requests using hypertext transfer protocol to a server, and it then responds and delivers the web page. And there are logs kept all over the place. There are logs on the server. There are logs on the intermediate devices. There are copies kept on your machine. You know, that's why if you want to lie and say you didn't do it, you got a big problem. Um, there was a case one of my teachers told me about where, um, we, we'll get to this later, but the first thing you do with Windows is you look in the registry, and the first place you look in the registry is USB store, because when you get a computer to examine, that means they wrote a court order to seize that evidence and examine it. And the first thing you do is look at USB store, because that will show what other storage devices have been plugged in this computer, and the first thing you need to do is write another court order for all those devices, because they've got data that came from that machine. And so, um, the, uh, he had a case where the, client, the person had a computer that had been used, apparently committed a crime, and he said, okay, I need to see that computer. And they said, well, we could give it to you, but you should know I sold it to my attorney, and my attorney reinstalled Windows, so all the evidence is gone. And he said, that doesn't matter. I'll have no problem getting all the evidence out of it. And that's when they just gave up and settled the case. They knew they were hosed. Because reformatting the hard drive and reinstalling Windows does not delete the old evidence. 
It is not so easy to delete the old evidence, and many amateurs do not understand how to do it. They're pretty, there are techniques to do it, but the common things people do are not good enough. And then, of course, cell phones. Cell phones and most modern devices, like my Mac here, um, work on SSDs, which are faster and use less power and more expensive, but they're very common. SSDs these days typically do not retain deleted information. There's a background process called garbage collection that erases all the information, so you usually can't get very much deleted data off an SSD. That's an issue. However, there's a ton of information on cell phones. Emails, SMS messages, photographs, uh, phone call logs, texts, just lots of good things there. So um, then there's Internet of Things. Now we've got smart light bulbs, smart uh, everything. So I read about a smart pillow at CES. Just everybody's got everything connected to the Internet. Everything is smart, and therefore it's collecting data. So all these other devices have data on them, and you'll find something on there. So the skills you need to work in this business, the main one is, of course, knowledge of IT and hardware. You have to understand how data is stored and how to recover it. Um, all right. And then you have to be able to uh, figure out how to prove someone was in control of a computer. Typically, the way you do that is you show that they logged into something, like their Facebook. That proves, because if you just find something on a computer, this computer did a bad thing, you don't know who was using it, unless you have a video record of who was using it. The next question is, they'll say, that wasn't me. Somebody broke into my house and did it without my permission. And he'll say, well, here you are logging into your email, so that pretty much proves it's you. Anyway, um, all right. And you can also prove that a website was accessed deliberately and multiple times if you're going to be prosecuting people for illegal use of websites like kitty porn, which is a big one, then you're going to prove that they really went there and they really went there multiple times and they can't claim that, oh, just some spam came in and I clicked on a link by accident and I didn't mean to go there. All right, Linux is very important. You have to know Windows and Linux. Windows and Linux are two main operating systems and uh, they're both very important. They're both everywhere and you have to be pretty good at finding your way around both of them. Android is Linux. It's the number one cell phone, although Apple just passed it today. But Apple, by the way, is Unix, which is basically the same thing, too. So cell phones and IoT devices are almost all Linux. Uh, the Mac is Linux. It's Unix, but very much the same. Um, but PCs are their own uh, Windows operating system. And they all have approximately the same data, but you have to use different tools and techniques to get it off of there. All right. Um, and then, of course, some knowledge of the law. Not enough to be a law degree or anything, but enough that you understand the rules of seizing evidence and so on. Um, the Fourth Amendment um, applies. You can't um, seize somebody else's stuff with evidence without getting a search warrant, where you must show probable cause. Um, unless, of course, which is most common, if you're working at a corporation, you can look at the company equipment without a search warrant because the person doesn't own it. And that applied a lot more back in the days when everybody went physically to work and used the physical computer there. Now a lot of people use their home computer for both personal stuff and work stuff, and they tried to stop that about 10 years ago when it became popular. The uh, legal teams and the forensic team said, wait a minute, this is going to make a mess when it's time to investigate a crime, but it's so convenient, everybody does it anyway, and it leads to a huge argument. Do you have the right to seize that machine? Well, it's half used for my personal stuff. Do you have the right to scan all the hard drive? Well, no, half of that is my personal stuff. It's a problem. But people put up with that irritation because it's so convenient. What they found out when, the, when uh, portable devices first came out about 10 or 15 years ago, uh, many companies said, we're going to ban use of portable devices and force them to come to work. And they said, if you do that, all the best people will leave. They are so happy with their iPhone and their MacBook and everything. They will go to another company that doesn't make them do that. Um, you, you have to accept this loss of control to keep the best workforce, and so people have done that. By the way, let me look in Twitch and see if anything's coming in. Can of course be recorded in Twitch. I'm recording and putting it on, um, on YouTube. I think you folks can record it on Twitch, but I'm not sure how that works. Um, many people are turned off from the field of friendship because of the unsavory material. Well, this I think is true of computer security in general. If you work in computer security, you will have to deal with criminals. And they will do nasty criminal things. There, um, I remember when I first taught Scene at 123, the first hacking class here, my students had to work with a root kit, and the name of the root kit was Fuck It. And I said, well, if there are any children in the room uh, that can't handle vulgarity and obscenity, forget it. This is crime. You're dealing with criminals. They are the worst people in the world. They are racist and abusive, and they lie and trick you into things, and they name their tools in vulgar ways. And, of course, a big field of forensics is uh, child pornography. And you need to be aware of that. Um, if you do ever come across child pornography anywhere, your investigation is over. Whatever you thought you were doing, it's over. 
you call the National Child Center for Exploited Children and you hand it over to the FBI and you never touch it again. Even possession of it is a felony. Whatever you thought you were doing, it's done. You're not doing it anymore. That stuff all goes away. It's like radioactive. You don't want to touch it. You don't want to be near it. Uh, the penalties are extreme. You hand that over to the FBI and you wash your hands of it. And whatever you were doing, you're going to have to do it without that device. Um, be aware of that. Most of us are not going to do French, that kind of examination, although I know a guy that does. But yeah, you need, you need a strong stomach like a cop. You're going to be dealing with nasty people doing bad things. Um, all right, well, IoT forensic could be more complicated. Yes, everything will be more complicated due to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and we're only beginning to see what that's going to do. Um, absolutely. All right. So let's see. Uh, all right. So you need good communication skills. Like I say, you need to write a clear report and you need to testify in court. If you take that as part of your job, and it often is, and therefore you have to be able to clearly explain things to non-technical people, which, by the way, is extremely important no matter what you do. If you just work at a corporation and you have to explain to your boss why you want funding for a project, you have to be able to make like an elevator pitch. That's why one of my friends watches some show called Shark Tank, which I've never seen, but apparently this is what it is. It's the funding pitches. You need to be able to explain to somebody who is not a specialist in your field what you're doing and why it's great in just a couple of minutes. This is a really good skill. Um, whatever you're doing, learn how to boil it down. Enrico Fermi was good at this. Enrico Fermi said, if you can't explain your theory to a barmaid, you don't understand it yourself. And he did atomic bomb theories, the most complicated stuff in the world. But he said, if you can't make it simple, you don't understand it yourself. Anyway, um, of course, linguistic abilities are useful. There are a lot of languages out there. I, I used to do a whole lot of capture the flag contests with my students. And one of them we did was, I think, North Korea. And so to make it fair, all the websites were in Hebrew. Like, oh. Well, it was North Korea, South Korea. There wasn't. Anyway, um, that was pretty harsh. I didn't get very far in that one. All right, and of course you have to keep learning, which is why you're all here. I think mostly adults probably have jobs, and yet you have to keep learning. This is the modern world. Um, you don't just go to school until you're 18 and then do the same thing forever. And you're going to need to keep learning forever in all fields of tech. And in particular, security is probably the most demanding because there are active intelligent criminals always thinking up some new bad thing to do. And you have to be constantly learning to keep up with them. This is, uh, I get a lot of people that are retraining because they were IT techs, but that was 20 years ago and now they need to retrain on the new stuff, and your knowledge from 20 years ago is largely not very good anymore. All right, and of course, you have to keep things confidential. This is another big field, like a lawyer, like a doctor, your security professional has to sign non-disclosure agreements, and you have to live by it. You are gonna learn things that are not public knowledge. You are gonna learn vulnerabilities about systems, you're gonna learn, read people's private emails and everything else, and some of that stuff will eventually go to court and be exposed, but that is not your job. That is for other people to choose. Your job, just like a doctor, is to keep confidential everything you find. You talk to your client and you submit reports there, but it's not public information. You don't go put it on public websites or anything. That is extremely unprofessional and uh, nobody will trust you again. Uh, this is what happened to Snowden. Snowden was a contractor for the NSA. He found a bunch of confidential documents. He, in fact, exceeded. He, in fact, got other people's credentials to get documents he didn't have research to, and then he had signed a non-disclosure agreement and he dumped them out publicly. And he fled, ended up in Russia, and he asked his lawyer what to do, and his lawyer said, please stay in Russia, marry Anna Chapman and never come back, because I don't want to defend you, because you absolutely signed a non-disclosure agreement, you absolutely publicly disclosed this stuff, I can't save you. Don't come back here. And that's what he did, he lives in Russia. Um, all right, so in the 80s, um, there was a an early one passed, and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act passed, which is the one primarily used to prosecute hackers. It also is extremely old and vague and unfortunately leads to a lot of people being prosecuted for completely innocent things, like me. Well, I didn't get prosecuted, but I uh, have been told by my lawyer that some of the stuff I did broke this law, and I had no idea. I thought, for example, I, there's a time when the University of um, Louisiana posted a bunch of medical data. I was searching for something else. They just posted thousands of records of medical data right on an open FTP server. So I contacted them and they took it down. And then a few months later, they accused me of hacking their system. I got my lawyer. You need a lawyer if you're going to work in any field, especially field. And I said, those bums, there was no password on it. And he said, you read the CFAA again. There doesn't need to be a password. If you send a request to a server and you gain information you're not supposed to have, you violated the CFAA, even if it's just sitting out in public. I said, that's not right. He said, well, that's the law. I said, 
This is not good. That's why I thought I was a whitehead. I thought I would never break the law. That's almost impossible, as anybody can find out. Um, whatever you do, there's some legal exposure, and you need to have a lawyer, and you need to consider your level of risk. Yeah. Did you get promised for that? Oh, yeah. What kind of uh, they published an article about me being the most terrible person doing this, and they complained to everybody at the college, and a bunch of people started agitating to get me fired. This used to happen every year. And what was the other time for, right? No, they didn't actually prosecute me. In fact, what I did was, with my lawyer giving me good advice, I made a deal with the journalist that he would change the article in return for me giving him an interview. And because uh, I mostly wanted to protect the college, and because uh, they were defaming the college. And you know, this is if you do any computer research, computer security research, you will have some legal risk. Even if you do the most innocent, like think of this college. This college is about the most altruistic thing you could do. You get free classes for everybody, ESL and social studies and everything, and yet we get sued all the time. They sue because the stairs are too steep for handicapped accessibility, one thing and another. If you do anything, you will get sued. There's some legal risk, even when you're trying your best to just do good stuff. Anyway, so the uh, Secret Service created the Electronic Crimes Task Force in the 90s. Uh, I'm a member. If you want to join, you have to prove that you, someone told me they dropped this, you have to prove that you never worked on defense because that makes you the enemy. This bothered me quite a lot. I thought a scientific, a forensic examiner was an objective scientist just finding the truth, but in fact, the prosecution hires an examiner and the defense hires an examiner, and they both apparently slant stuff to favor their side. Anyway, so, but the Electronic Crimes Task Force is the Secret Service, and they have very good meetings. It's very much worth being a member of. Um, and they have the Regional Computer Forensic Lab come up in the 90s. These are government labs to do forensic examination, and they wrote quite a few tools. We'll probably use some of them later. And the Patriot Act, after 9-11, um, greatly lowered privacy rights in America and digital privacy rights. Now, if, you, if the government says that a terrorist crime has happened, they basically can just take anything from anywhere. And um, by the way, this hit the news. If you listen to C. Gibson's podcast, which I highly recommend, called Security Now, uh, two weeks ago, he spent the whole podcast talking about the latest Apple flaw. Mm -hmm. They found malware that infected iPhones, and they found that iPhones have a secret backdoor that gives you access to all the data, and it is secured and hidden in such a way that it would almost never be found by accident. Nobody could figure out how to use it by accident. It, and his suspicion, which cannot be proven, is that the Secret Service forced Apple to put in a backdoor which they totally could. They had these things called national security letters that come from the Patriot Act. The government come to you with a national security letter and order you to let them have access to the data at your company and never tell anybody, not even your attorney. It is very disturbing. It seems almost clearly unconstitutional, but that's the way it is. And uh, there was a guy, the guy that had, I think, Snowden's emails, they had a private server, and he thought the government was going to come for it, so he shut down his business and canceled it, and they came to him with a national security letter, and they said, we don't care if you shut down your business, you still have to give us this guy's emails and not tell anybody. And so it's, um, it's tough, but this is the thing. Uh, the terrorist acts do this. And in Britain, they have a lot more terrorism, which is why they have a lot less privacy and a lot more government able to intrude on things. And when they uh, you know, ask people on the street in Britain, what do you think of this? Most of them say, if the government has to read my email to stop the bombing, that's fine. I don't care. I don't want privacy as much as I want them to catch the terrorists, which is the attitude that was popular here after 9-11, and it would get more popular if we had more terrorism. Anyway, so 2010, cryptocurrency came out, which lets you transfer money online and anonymously, at least somewhat anonymously, although most of the popular ones like Bitcoin and Ethereum are not really very anonymous at all, but in the early days, people didn't know how to track them. And so that made it possible for ransomware and many other forms of computer crime, uh, many other forms of illegal transactions to proliferate online. And IoT devices, of course, which means there's a whole lot more digital evidence and a lot of other security issues. And May 2013, Ed Snowden um, greatly changed the world uh, by dumping a bunch of NSA secrets that revealed that the NSA had been hacking American companies as if they were adversaries. And this caused many security features to upgrade. Everybody jumped to TLS 1.2 in a hurry. And it also greatly embarrassed the US by revealing the fact that the NSA whose absolute number one mission is to keep the secrets, was not able to keep their secrets. And that is not good. Because the NSA's official mission is to achieve no bus, nobody but us. They want a backdoor into every system that they can get in, but nobody else. Like the one that appears to have been built into iPhones for the last four hardware cycles. And if they don't keep the secrets, 
then other people can get in through their back doors, and that has happened over and over and over. It is a problem. So lots of places you can get training and are up in professional certifications. The main one that is most valuable is the, uh, where the heck is it? Um, in case analyst. Ah, oh, there, in case certified examiner. This is the one most people ask for. Uh, in America, police departments almost all use NCASE, and they want you to have this certification. Uh, the FBI uses FTK, and that's Access Data's AC. These are the two certifications that are most valuable. We're not going to get either in this course. We're going to use free open source tools. Both of these are expensive tools, and we don't have the budget to equip a lab with these. But if you get, uh, and you can use open source tools, but most people don't. They use these commercial tools that are very expensive, and uh, then they get people who are certified in those tools. All right. So let me uh, check for questions on Twitch again. Uh, looks like, uh, all right. Yep, there's something about the Apple secret backdoor. Good, good. All right, so I'm going to stop this recording.